The murder of Stephen Smith in the early morning hours of July 8, 2015, is one of South Carolina's biggest unsolved mysteries. But it wasn't always that way. Prior to this case being tied into the famed Murdoch family of Hampton County, South Carolina, not a whole lot of people cared what happened to Stephen Smith. But in the aftermath of this investigation being tied into the Murdoch murders, crime and corruption saga, all of a sudden, everyone cared. It's the focus of national documentaries, of independent investigations, and most importantly, a state law enforcement division homicide investigation, which was opened, by the way, in the immediate aftermath of the double homicide of Paul Murdoch and Maggie Murdoch, a crime for which Alec Murdoch has been convicted and sentenced to life in prison. In the aftermath of that trial, the focus has turned back on the Stephen Smith story. Theories abound. Murdoch family members have been implicated and denied involvement. But what is the truth? What really happened on that road near Crockettville, South Carolina, in the early morning hours of July 8, 2015? We sat down this week with a retired U.S. Drug Enforcement agent, a private investigator, and the leader of the National Law Enforcement Speakers Bureau. His name is Steve Peterson. He covered this case, investigated this case, followed every lead in this case for months on end during his tenure as an investigator working for Sandy Smith, Stephen's mother. In this conversation, we will hear about Murdoch family ties, about connections to this case that don't lead back to the Murdochs. But most importantly, we will hear from this investigator, who arguably knows this case better than anyone, what he believes happened to Stephen Smith. Here is my interview with Steve Peterson. Steve, I appreciate you being here, man. Before we dive into this, I got to ask you, you've got a long history, federal agent, DEA, You've seen some stuff, haven't you? I, 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 more than some and less than others, <laughs> you know? Walk us through some of your, your just personal history. Where are you from? How'd you get into law enforcement? Oh, I'm a, I'm a Bostonian. Uh, grew up outside of Boston. Went to college in Boston. I'm second generation American. My uh, parents came from Sweden. Well, my, my grandparents. And uh, I found out, and this is funny, I found out about maybe a decade ago, a little more, uh, that my grandmother was a human trafficking victim, was sold to a family, for, I, her family in Sweden, sold to a family in New England as an indentured servant. And then when she grew up, they arranged her marriage and she met her husband, my grandfather, on the day of their wedding. Oh, wow. I had no idea. She, oh. My grandmother told this all to my wife one day. And my wife came to bed one night. She said, hey, I was talking to your grandmother. She said, but I was like, what? I was stunned. She's getting a good family Yeah, <laughs> I was like, holy crap. I went to my dad. I was like, he goes, yeah. And I was like, funny you didn't think that was important ever to bring up in our life. <laughs> and so it was, anyway, this is a little side story. So I grew up outside of Boston. I always wanted to be a cop, but uh, I had an uncle who was a customs inspector in Miami. And he was a funny guy. He, uh, one day they seized all this marijuana at a boat in Miami. And he and one or two others swept up all the seeds off the deck after they picked up all of them. And he planted it around the customs <laughs> office in Miami. They planted all these seeds. And a few weeks later, all this marijuana started growing outside the customs house. They never figured out it was him. And uh, maybe that's where I get my sense of humor from. Mm. But uh, he's the one who told me, you need to go to DEA. Work for DEA. Don't be a cop. Work for DEA. Told me all about DEA. And uh, I thought about going to law school. I worked for the district attorney's office in Worcester County, Mass. Worcester County is the largest county. Mm -hmm. They're not like counties down here, but because in, in uh, Massachusetts, the, the only thing the sheriff does is run the courthouse and the jail. They don't, and they serve civil papers. They don't do any enforcement. They don't, they don't do anything it's like that. It's all county police. Yeah, or state, uh, it's, it's all uh, town or city police. There's no unincorporated parts of any county. Oh, wow, okay. It's either one town or another, so. Um, I, was, uh, I was the youngest paramedic in the state of Massachusetts and while I was in college. And I, I went to Northeastern University, which had a cooperative education program, which meant you went to school for six months, then you went on the job somewhere for six months. And your employer might or might not pay you. <laughs> the district attorney's office didn't pay me for the first six-month period, but then they pay, I became the first paid intern they ever had. They paid me 
for the second time. And so what were you doing for them? I did a lot of victim witness processing, a lot of paperwork, a lot of filing. I sat in magistrate's court a lot, just wrote down, kept numbers, kept track of stuff. All administrative crap. And you're how old at this time? I'm like 18, 19 wow. years old. I was just, I mean, I was so literally the a book. kid. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a kid. And uh, so then I, I got hired by DEA. I started in New York City as a dispatcher, uh, but they don't call them dispatchers, but that's what they're saying. Because DEA doesn't work like police. People don't call in and we send people. So we were in a, a room about twice the size of this room with you know radios, computers everywhere, and we would help coordinate surveillance activities. And so if people call in tags, names, we'd run them to give the information back out. This is all, again, pre-cell phone days. You know, so you'd have guys up in the street with a, di a pocket full of quarters and run the payphone, call us, we'd relay information, do all this stuff. So I did that, went back, and you get graded from your employer. So I got, I mean, they gave me a grade when I go back to school as part of my GPA. So I uh, went back to school for my last six months, went, or when my second term came up, uh, I worked for DEA in Boston. I didn't go back to New York City, worked in the city of Boston, which was great because I kept my apartment, took the subway to work. Did, back then, we were out in cars with agents on surveillance. We, I mean, we did stuff. Yeah. Today, nowadays, you can't leave the office, you know, liabilities, concern. I guess nobody cared about us back then, but we did a lot of stuff. So DEA had an agreement with the, with the Department of Justice that if you did two consecutive six-month terms, and DEA was hiring, you wouldn't have to compete with everybody else. You could be brought in. So I, I doubled up on classes. I graduated six months early because my concern was, again, pre-internet days. Al Gore hadn't invented it yet. So my concern was I got to get in the job market before all these other people graduate. All right, so if I can graduate three months early, maybe I'll be that much ahead. So I graduated early and I, I remember I called the big boss up in DEA Boston, the equivalent of the guy in Atlanta who transferred me. I called him and I said, hey, I'm graduating. I just took my last, my last exam on Friday. Technically, I don't have my grades, but I passed everything. Um, and I'm looking to, I'm applying for different positions, different police agencies, and can I use your name as a reference? And he said, no. Uh, and I was like, excuse me? And he says, no, and I don't have time to discuss it with you. You want to talk to me about it, schedule an appointment with, through my secretary. And he hung up the phone on me. And I was pissed. I was mad. Uh, and then on a Thursday night, I got a call from somebody who claimed to be DEA headquarters. And, and, but I questioned it because it was like 5.30. And I know no a DEA headquarters worked at 5.30. But she called up and said, hey, listen, we have a basic agent academy class. Back then, our academy was at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in South Georgia, Fletzy, Glencoe, Georgia. There's a Fletzy Charleston, but Glencoe's the mothership. Massive, massive place. And um, we're offering you a seat in the academy. Uh, but you have to be there this Sunday. I said, Sunday like in three days, Sunday? They said, yes. I said, well, let me check my schedule. I got nothing going. So I went. Obviously, I went. And uh, my mom had a big party for me Saturday night. She had a big cake. It said, congratulations, Steve. Good luck with the FDA. <laughs> and I was like, the FDA? She goes, yeah, that's the Federal Drug Agency. I was like, no, Ma, that's the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> uh, FDA, DEA, what the hell? They're all the same. So I was like, all right. God bless. I retired. My mom still didn't really know what I did. So but um, How old were you with the agency? Uh, if you factor in my leave, my sick leave annually, 30 years. Wow. I was tw 29 years in service when you factor in all the leave time you accumulate over 29 years. So I had another year of leave and, and stuff accumulated. Took down some big scores? Um, I was involved in the case that was the inspiration behind Breaking Bad. We arrested the real Walter White. Wow. So that was probably, and there was a lot of other significant cases. My best friend and first partner uh, Ray Stasny, God bless him, was killed on his job in Atlanta in 87. He was murdered by a Mexican drug trafficker. And I ended up being the case agent in his trial of his murder, of the people oh associated with his murder. So there were 
while that's not a big significant drug case, it was probably the most significant case I've ever worked in my life. And then there were a bunch of other stuff over the years, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I retired in 2010. Mm -hmm. I, I took over the uh, National Law Enforcement Speakers Bureau. We, back then, asset forfeiture was a very popular program in law enforcement. And what, what that means is basically if, if an agency assists DEA in identifying and seizing assets that belong to drug traffickers that they've accumulated through ill-gotten gains through drug trafficking, DEA can seize those assets, forfeit them, and then we give 80% of that back to the agency that helped us. 20% for right. Yes, 20% goes to DOJ. DEA keeps nothing. But 20 goes to DOJ, 80 goes back to the agency. And those agencies are are limited in what they can spend that money on. Very very specific as to what they can do. One of the things is training. So when I retired, I started a training company and we were very busy. Agencies were because I had done training for DEA for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And I wrote their training manual up in Quantico that they still use to my knowledge. So, uh, and then when the Obama administration took over, they did away with asset forfeiture sharing. And they put real tight restrictions. So all these agencies, their money's dried up, training dried up. And I thought, holy crap, well, I guess I'll just be retired. And my youngest daughter said, I wanna go to culinary school at 40 grand a year. And I thought, how the hell am I gonna afford that? And just, I mean, you know, God has a plan. And uh, I, then a, a couple days after that, I got a phone call from Fletzy, the Federal Office of Training Center from Georgia. And the guy who was like the number two guy down there was the assistant director of the DEA Academy in Quantico. Now we had never met, but I had heard of him, I knew of him, he had heard of me and knew of me. And he called me and uh, asked me if I'd be interested in go to work as an instructor. So I went down to Glencoe and I interviewed and they hired me and I thought I was going to Glencoe. But they said, no, 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 we hired you, but you're gonna go to work in Charleston. I didn't even know there was a flat scene. And I was like, all the better. <laughs> so I came here and I you landed was a, in a pretty good spot. I, I, God bless, <laughs> you know, I mean, I have been, my whole life I've been blessed. I really have. I've landed on my feet every time. And I stayed with Fletzy for about five years as an instructor. And then the zombie apocalypse came and shut down everything, right? So no more in-person training, no more of this stuff. And as a rehired annuitant, I didn't have the same union protections as all the other DHS employees. Because now I don't work for DOJ anymore, I work for DHS that runs you know, the academies. So and you gotta go make some money. Yeah. So I started making some calls and, and, and asking people and interviewing with law firms, just saying, listen, do you need somebody to help you track down witnesses? Do you need somebody to take proffers from your clients? Do you need, I mean, I can do all that. I'm not, certain things I'm not gonna work on. I'm not gonna work on cases against cops. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna work on any domestic violence or abuse of children. I'm not doing that, mm. you know. But I'll, but, so I had a lot of interviews, but really no takers because everybody said, well, we don't really have anything. The courts are shut down. We're not doing anything. Uh, and then on Father's Day, I got a call and the guy says on the phone, he says, hey, I just had a client arrested for attempted murder. You up for a challenge? I was like, who is this? <laughs> I had no idea who I, it was Andy Savage. And he had called me and I had sent him some information and he called me and so I met with him and we worked on that case and I did some work with him on the, he handled the civil aspect of the, the Charleston Church shooting where uh, that idiot shot, what, nine people in the church. Mm -hmm. And he said, this Savage law firm worked on the civil kind, they sued the FBI for stuff. And I worked on that case with him and then he called me in and, and said, hey listen, are you familiar with the Murtaugh's? And I said, no, I mean, who are that? No, I never heard of them, don't know. He goes, good. <laughs> he says, I want you, we represent Sandy Smith, the mother of a, chi of a child, 19 year old boy who was found dead in the middle of the road. Don't know if there's any connection, but SLED thinks there is because SLED went in to investigate the murder of Paul and Maggie and claimed that they had come across something that led them to reopen the Smith case. So there's obviously a connection there. This is So Savage comes to you after 
sleds opened? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is... Because uh, once it appeared that once SLED re-announced the opening of Stephen's investigation, the media, and they didn't swarm in because of Stephen, but now you've got the Mallory Beach boat wreck, mm -hmm. and you've got Paul and Maggie's death, and you got add Gloria Satterfield, the housekeeper, now you got see you got four people dead, mm -hmm. you know, surround, five people, really. Five counts. When you think about all this. So the media is swarming Hampton County, and Sandy Smith is getting inundated with media banging on a door, wanting to enter, and she doesn't, she's like, I don't want any of this attention. Mm -hmm. So Andy agreed to represent her, uh, which I didn't, under, I didn't know initially, but she, he did that pro bono, he did that for free. Oh, wow. I'll represent you, and, and that way none of the media will bother you, and we'll handle all that. And, and try and find out what happened. We'll find out, and we'll try. So we, we all sat down, we had a meeting, and, uh, and he, Andy was great. I mean, Andy just said, okay, Steve, you know some of the basics now. Go. Go do. <laughs> you know, and just keep me updated. Go do. I mean, he never interfered. He never made, I mean, he might make suggestions as to which lead to perhaps uh, focus on or, to, or, or pursue, but he never got involved in any decision making regarding the investigation. He just supported me. Mm -hmm. And uh, take us back to the your first exposure to these just horrific images from the crime scene, from the autopsy. Well, and I didn't see was... them for months. Really? Yes, because by the time we got involved, SLED had reopened the investigation. Okay. So now it's an open criminal investigation. So nobody will share information with us. Andy's filing all these four-year requests and so forth to try to get information, and, and nobody's giving us anything back. Hmm. Sorry, you were unable to provide. We're not a ongoing investigation. Yeah, and I, sure. so we were like, "Holy crap!" Well, I went and met with Sandy, and I sat down with her in her kitchen, and she said, "Here's all the paperwork I have, mm -hmm. and I've collected this. The Highway Patrol gave this to me years ago, and I've written letters to the FBI. I've written letters to Nikki Haley. I've written letters to all these people. I'm trying to get someone to solve my son's death, and nobody cares." Mm -hmm. So she gave me everything she had, but what was interesting about that is, excuse me, <clears throat> the day I arrived to interview Sandy for the first time at her home, hours before I got there, two other guys showed up. Now they had come a year previously, right? So I'm there in 2021. Mm -hmm. In 2020, these two idiots show up. I call them Daryl and his other brother, Daryl. I call them Daryl and Daryl. So Daryl and Daryl show up. They claim to be private investigators from Hilton Head. They're going to solve Stephen's death. So Sandy's like, absolutely. Hey, Andy, Sandy, welcome anybody. If you want to help me find out who killed my son, God bless you. Satan, come on in. I mean, it doesn't matter. If you can help me get answers, I will accept your help. So they said yes. And uh, so I asked Sandy, I said, well, who pays these guys? Who do they work for? And she says, I have no idea. They wouldn't tell me. So well, they're not doing it for free. So uh, let's figure out. So they got all, she gave them all the paperwork she had. She gave them everything. She gave them his, I, Stephen's iPad. She gave them his, I, I think she gave them his computer. Um, she gave them, she didn't have the phone. The phone was always kept by law enforcement. But she never got the phone back. She gave them, what else? The Highway Patrol had, at some point, open the phone up and then taken all the photographs, a select number of photographs mm -hmm. from the phone and given her a CD with all these photographs. They said, Highway Pro said, there are more photographs here, but I, but I think they were related to Stephen's questionable lifestyle and they didn't want to burden Sandy with pictures like this. Mm -hmm. So they didn't give her any of that. Hmm. So. She got that. And so these guys got all that. And then they came back, coincidentally, hours before I arrived and returned it all, with the exception of the iPad. The, she didn't give the, they didn't give the iPad back. Now, when I went to interview Sandy, Sandy had already been interviewed by the SLED by then. Because I got involved weeks after Paul and Maggie's. It wasn't like the day after, it was mm -hmm. weeks after. 
And so she gave me the sled agent's name and phone number that she had spoken to, and she gave me Daryl and Daryl's numbers and stuff. Excuse me. And um, so I, I reached out to Daryl and Daryl and just advised them, Sandy now has counsel, and you're not allowed. We're instructing you not to have any more direct contact with Sandy. If you want to contact Sandy, you must go through either myself or the Savage Law Firm, Andy's firm, mm -hmm. go through them and arrange whatever it is, or ask questions and we'll get the answers for you, but you're not allowed to have contact with her anymore. But we want the iPad back. We want the iPad back. Oh, yeah, 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 we'll give it to you. We'll get it. And I called SLED and asked for a meeting with them. And I can't... I, I met with SLED and SLED, SLED was very reluctant, number one, to meet with me. Mm -hmm. But I can understand that. I'm a retired guy. I'm, 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 an attorney, I'm an, a, a, a guy asking questions for a law firm. If I was a DEA, I never would have spoken to me. Sure. You know what I mean? I'd be like, go away. <laughs> and Sled had the same attitude. And I said, listen, I'm not here to get in the way. I'm not here to hurt you guys. I, I'm a cop. Mm -hmm. And I'm retired. But a cop is not just a job. That's who you are. I said, I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm not here to embarrass you guys. I'm here to find out what happened to Stephen Smith. You guys can take all the credit. You guys can get all the press release. You guys can do everything. I just want to tell Sandy what happened to her son. That's all I want. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. I will tell you everything I find out. I will share everything. I will have no secrets with you. It wasn't really reciprocal. <laughs> at first, it wasn't reciprocal at all. Um, but then, that, and I've got all the texts. I got a text from Sled going, are you the Batman? <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm the Batman. <laughs> and he said, all right, my supervisors know who you are. Mm -hmm. And they've given me approval to work with you. They've given me a green light to keep sharing information. Keep, I was like, keep sharing? <laughs> that's, uh, that's being generous. So we had pretty good um, communication at some point. It still wasn't everything. Right. It was like an 80-20 kind of thing. But it was better than nothing. Sure. And Sled told me they went to Daryl and Daryl's place with a search warrant because they Daryl and Daryl wouldn't give them the iPad. So Sled went to Daryl and Daryl's with a search warrant and seized the iPad. Mm -hmm. And it was completely smashed. And all the information was irretrievable. They had busted the iPad. Deliberately. Yes. So like physically smashed. Physically, it was destroyed. Wow. This is what Sled told me. <clears throat> So then a couple of weeks after that... How is that not obstruction of justice? Well, or why have we not heard of people being exactly. charged? Exactly. That, that, that was my point. So then, this is the point after it's become an active oh, yeah. homicide Oh, this is act, yes. And there's a lot of instances. If I, I'm, I, I will end up being out of sequence on a lot of these things because it happened funny. But one of the earlier interviews I did was with one of the mate team members. Mm -hmm. And I try not to mention names when I do interviews, right? But it was a mate team member who's no longer with the highway patrol. He's working for a deputy, a sheriff's office here locally as a school resource officer. He got let go from the highway patrol and wanted to finish getting his years in law enforcement in for his retirement under South Carolina law. Got to have 25 years in. And so I met with him, and that was some reluctance on his part to meet with, but he did meet with me. And when I met with him for the first time, the first question out of his mouth was, you wearing a wire? <laughs> and I was like, what? And he goes, are you wearing a wire? Are you, are you recording this? I was like, why would I do that? Mm -hmm. You're a cop, I'm a cop. Why would I record you? <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, well, it turns out, in my opinion, all he wanted to do was sell his story. He was trying to sell. He had gone to a couple other media outlets trying to sell them and some what information. was the story? Well, he wanted to tell the whole Stephen Smith story. Yeah. So I said, by now, I've got copies of what Sandy gave me. Mm -hmm. I got like a hundred and something pages from Sandy. But many of the pages that Sandy gave me are duplicates. So mm -hmm. I get like five pages of this. And, but, and if you, they were not all sequential, but there, there would be some, you know, page three of five. Well, I got page three, but there's no four and five. Mm -hmm. But I got four pages of three. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and, and I don't know if Sandy, I don't know if Daryl and Daryl were the cause of this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Sandy doesn't know. She couldn't keep up with it all. She's had these papers for five years. 
her grandchild is coloring on the back of them. You know, I mean, so she doesn't know what's, uh, so I've seen some information, but I haven't seen everything. Mm -hmm. And I was asking this trooper about, our ex-trooper about it, and he said that at some point in 2015, information was being leaked either to the press or to the Murtaugs mm -hmm. about the Stephen Smith case. Mm -hmm. And the Highway Patrol's management were concerned that they've got these leaks. So they told all the mate members, according to this one trooper, don't put any of your written reports in the mate da database. I guess they have their own internal database. They store crap. Instead, keep it individually on your laptop. Hmm. Don't put it in the database. Someone has access to the database that we don't approve of and don't author, and they're leaking information. Wow. So he said when he ended up leaving mate and leaving the highway patrol, he took with him reports that nobody's ever seen. He's never filed, no one's ever seen him. And I was like, how can you do that, dude? How can you leave? You've got reports on Stephen's death that nobody's shared, you've never seen. But he's trying to sell them. He's trying to sell stuff. So I told this Has to that SLED. Has that information been provided to SLED? Uh, no, I told this to SLED. Mm -hmm. I told SLED, hey, this is what I just interviewed. So SLED went and interviewed the guy. Mm -hmm. And the guy gave him a flash drive that he claims he had all his stuff on. And my SLED counterpart was saying, there are people within SLED that want him indicted right now for obstruction. But of course, nothing ever happened. So who knows? Uh, you know, I don't know. So there's multiple people that are perverting the course of yes. this case. Oh, yes. Okay. For various reasons. Everybody has a reason in this case. Mm -hmm. Everybody has an agenda in this case. And so then another person I interviewed was, I went, I spoke to the coroner. Mm -hmm. Now I didn't talk to the, I spoke to the current coroner of Hampton County. And she was very nice to me, very nice woman. And she said, listen, Stephen Smith was before my time. I don't know anything about it. I don't have any authority over it, really. That was my predecessor. He's no longer, he was fired or whatever. He's no longer here. And I said, I understand. But he had an assistant who was also fired. And the assistant coroner was there at the scene with him at Stephen's death. Took her own pictures. Took her own pictures. Mm -hmm. And so I tracked her down to her home and... She had been fired, so she's no longer with Hampton County. I tracked her down. She was somewhat surprised to see me. Um, and she was telling me all this. Yes, I've got my own pictures. I've got all this. I, got, I was like, can I see them? Would you <laughs> share them with me? She goes, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share them with you. And she went up and got her computer and came back down and goes, it's dead. They had just moved into their house a few months ago. I don't know where the power cord is for this particular computer. I can't charge it up, but I will get it. I will... Never did. I followed up with her a half dozen times. And she ended up saying, well, the county said I can't release them. And I said, why are you even asking them for permission? They've got nothing to say over this. You, they fired you. You're not with them anymore. You don't need their approval. These are your pictures you took, right? So they, you sh but he, she never did. So of course I told that to SLED. SLED wanted to go. I think they went to interview her as well to get whatever she had. So all this information that's being compiled is not, it, it's not being shared with anybody. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, so come September, and I, I want to say this was just after the uh, Alec Murtaugh's fake being shot in the side of the road thing. Um, Daryl and Daryl call Sandy Smith back, leave a message. She doesn't take the call. She's then called by some woman claiming to be a reporter from New York. And uh, so she doesn't call her back. So she gives me this information. So I called Daryl and Daryl back and I was like, listen, Daryl and Daryl, guys, no, we had this conversation. I'm not to call her. You got something to say or a question or whatever, you call me. Well, we just wanted to let her know that this woman from New York was, we gave the woman in New York her number, so you're going to call her. I said, you can relay that to me. I said, by the way, why I got you on the phone? Where's that iPad? <laughs> now, SLED told me they have already seized it. And they told me it's already broken. And I said, you guys, and they were like, SLED has it. And I said, well, as far I don't, I want to see a receipt. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, you're the last one who had it. You're responsible for it. Our client gave it to you 
and therefore you're responsible for it. So I want to see a receipt that SLED gave you. I'm sure if they had a warrant, you got a receipt. Well, they don't want to talk to me. So we start getting this argument over all this. And I said, by the way, they told me you broke it. Uh, uh, it was broken when we got it. I said, really? Yes, it was broken. And I said, if it was broken when you got it, why did you keep it for a year? Hmm. You returned the other computer within weeks. Mm -hmm. So why did you keep the laptop or the, the iPad for, for a year? Why did you consistently call Stephen's sister, Stephanie, asking her for the password to the iPad if it was broken? You couldn't have got in anyways. Hmm. So they just hung up the phone on me. <laughs> they didn't want to talk to me. They hung up the phone on me. So then I called this reporter from New York and I explained, you know, who I was and why I was calling. Well, I'd like to talk to Sandy. I said, well, she's not really giving interviews right now. And I said, but let me ask you, if you don't mind me asking, how did you get her cell phone number? How did you do that? She goes, oh, well, you know, these two detectives, whatever, investigators, Daryl and Daryl, they gave me their number. I said, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. I said, but you're up in New York. Of all the gin joints in all the world, how do you find Daryl and Daryl? You know, how did that happen? Well, it's a long story. I, said, oh, I got nothing but time. <laughs> she said, well, my good friend, Roman something, I think Roman was his last name, something Roman, Roman something. <laughs> He's a consultant, Middle Eastern consultant, and he does a lot of business down in Paris Island. And he was down in Paris Island doing something, and this heard all about the big Murtaugh circus and decided he was going to write a book on it. So he hired Daryl and Daryl to do a bunch of background work on it for his book. Then he decided he didn't want to write a book. So he said, I could have all his background stuff. I just have to buy it from Daryl and Daryl because he wasn't going to buy it. So I had to buy it. So she said, I bought it all from them. I said, oh. And then I come to find out part of that materials that she, they sold to her were videos of Mallory Beach, some, some videos were involving the lawsuit that were under seal, that were not public, that were not supposed to be, and they, she published them online. So that caused a whole other big stink. <laughs> and I was like, I got, I'm out, I, you know what I mean? But she continued to call me, the attorney, this uh, uh, reporter. Cause that she, helped you pinpoint where Daryl and Daryl were coming from. Yes. You said earlier, yes. everyone's got an agenda. Right. Daryl and Daryl turned out they were hired by Parker's, mm -hmm. Parker's convenience store. But they were hired through a third party, so there wouldn't be a direct connection to Parker. But their job was to get background information on anybody who could, they were trying to get bad information or proof that, for example, that Paul Murtaugh was an out of control drunk kid. And so that could kind of diminish the capabilities or culpabilities of Parker's convenience. So, so they were digging up as much dirt as they could on everybody, mm -hmm. on all the players. Hmm. So that's who Daryl and Daryl ended up working for. And they're the ones that destroyed the evidence in this Yes, case. yes, yes. So um, I haven't had any contact with them for Couple years what do we now. think was on that device? Because we've seen photos and we've seen images uh, that clearly appear to be Stephen Smith holding an iPad into a mirror. Right, right. Provocative. You've probably seen more pictures than I. I've not seen any provocative pictures of Stephen. I've never seen every photograph that's come off his phone. Because, you know, Highway Pro wouldn't share those back with the family. Mm -hmm. I've only seen what Sandy gave me on a CD. And then what other news corporations, news outlets have published online or in open media, I've seen those pictures. Most of them are the same or similar. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I can't remember when we finally got, I finally saw the autopsy pictures. It might have been from the co deputy coroner. Mm -hmm. When I finally saw pictures of the, she may, I think she gave me a, a file that had copies of the photos from the road when he was yeah. killed. Well, let's go back to those for a minute because one of the things I noted when, when we looked at the Paul Murdoch, Maggie Murdoch crime scene and autopsy photos, which were incredibly difficult to look at. I can but, imagine. But we felt we were hearing all this testimony during the trial about trajectories and entry wounds and right. exit wounds. Right. And you know, the defense is arguing one thing, the prosecution's arguing the other. 
we figured if we had an opportunity to look at the evidence ourselves, obviously not releasing it, right. that that would aid in the process of reporting and of covering it. Same thing I think is true as it relates to Stephen Smith, because these photos, one of the first things I noted is that, first of all, this kid is in the middle of this road, square in the middle of this road, mm -hmm. not off to the side where you'd be if you're hit by a car or a window of a car. Right. What's he doing in the road? Second, there's no, doesn't appear to be a blood trail to there. It appears as though he's literally. But you see a huge blood splatter. Correct. You see a massive blood splatter. Walk us through what you saw in the crime scene. You see, you see a massive contusion right above his, what I assume is his right eye. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's to, when I looked at it, it looks to me as if he was either struck with like a two by six or the side mirror of a pickup truck. Big mirror. So you... That's what it looks like to me. You think hit and runs in play? I, I absolutely do. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, I do. How does he end up in the middle of the road? Can't answer those. I, I, don't, have, <laughs> I don't have all the answers. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I haven't seen all the evidence. Mm -hmm. How can I have all the answers? I haven't seen all the information. Um, you know, back in my day, being a paramedic, mm -hmm. I saw all kinds of injuries. I saw all kinds of accidents. I've picked body parts up off the road. People lose a sliver or a limb. Um, I mean, some gruesome, gruesome things. So when I saw the, the trauma to Stephen's head, the last thing in the world I thought of was this was a gunshot. Right. This is not a gunshot. Mm -hmm. There's no exit wound. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But the coroner's office mm -hmm. claimed that was the first theory. That's the first. Yeah. So, so this poor guy's driving to work in the morning, sees a body in the road, calls 911. There's Tow a truck driver. Yeah, you've heard his voice a thousand. Oh, there's a body in the road, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he reports a body. The deputies go out there. There's a body laying in the road. Ooh, there is a body. <laughs> they call the coroner because they're not qualified to say the body's dead. Eh, pretty obvious. Coroner comes out, body's dead. Coroner says, gunshot. Mm -hmm. Well, they had already called mate or the highway patrol because it's on the road. In the road, absolutely. Right? Now, why Hampton County couldn't investigate a death in the road is beyond me. But, you know, you can call somebody else and pass it off. Why not? So they call. They also call, when the coroner said gunshot, they called SLED. Mm -hmm. So SLED's crime scene is there. <laughs> highway patrol's there. Yep. Uh, one one guy, I think one, maybe two troopers of the highway patrol came there that day when Stephen's body was still there. Mm -hmm. But they were told by SLED, this is ours. Mm -hmm. They didn't take any photographs. They may have walked around, mm -hmm. but they didn't do anything. Correct. Excuse me. But so, they did record their observations, which were that they found nothing to consistent. suggest to them that it was a vehicular. Right. Because you would imagine that if somebody, if you hit somebody with a car, there would be bits of car. Mm -hmm. Right? You would imagine. So they hit you with a mirror, there'd be bits of glass. Mm -hmm. But not if the mirror was already broken and there was no glass. I, I don't know. His shoes were still on his feet. You I can't explain that. them to be off if it was Yes. Mm. Yeah, that, it doesn't always happen that the shoes fall off, but it frequently does. Frequently does. So your body relaxes completely. You know, your feet are, if you don't have, like I don't have yeah, laces in my shoes fitting, now. Yeah, yeah. Wearing... If I got hit, my feet would be so relaxed, my shoes could fly off. <laughs> but, it, but that doesn't always happen, mm -hmm. you know? So why his body is positioned exactly where it is, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. But you can see the, because it was suggested by several people that he was killed somewhere else. He was beaten, killed somewhere else, dumped in the road there. Well, of all the places in the road, uh, to anywhere to dump them, why dump them in the middle of the road there? Unless you wanted somebody to find them eventually. Mm -hmm. Hell, you could dump them in the side of the road and be days before anybody saw them. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't believe that only because there was too much blood at the scene. Mm -hmm. And if I killed you here, Will, and drug you a mile away to drop your body, all your blood would be here and in the vehicle that I used to transport you somewhere else. By the time I dropped your, your body there, there would be very little blood left to bleed out on. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have the significant blood that was on the scene that day. A ton of blood. A ton. So I don't believe he was killed anywhere else. Hmm. I believe he was, he was killed there at the scene. 
So I came down with two theories. Theory A, theory B. Theory A involved members of perhaps the Murtaugh family and two or three other individuals with them. Mm -hmm. And they've been driving around, by happenstance, came across Stephen walking in the road. May have offered him a ride, perhaps. And then just started kind of messing with him, screwing with him, teasing him. Right? They didn't mean it. And then in my mind, um, this is I'm playing back in my mind what I think happened in theory A, is that the, the car was going to, they were going to say, all right, screw this. Let's go. Let's leave him alone. Let's do, Stephen's in the road. Because they were talking. The car stopped and they were talking to Stephen on the side, right there in the road. It's in the middle of the night. Nobody drives on the road. Hell, I was in that road almost five hours one afternoon and I think 12 cars went by me. So at four in the morning, there'd be nobody there. So then they decided, all right, so the car either speeds up, turns around, comes back, and when they came back, somebody stuck something out the window. Two by four, a bat, an object, struck Stephen, game over. I don't think it was the intention. I think they were just trying to screw with him. I think maybe they're trying to scare him, and it just got out of hand. Just got out of hand. So that's theory A. That's theory A, right? What's theory B? So maybe? theory B is these two other idiots um, are drunk, totally drunk. They have names, Tosa. Well, I, you have <laughs> na- you've already reported on all well, these they're names. in the report. So, uh, I, yeah, but I don't Pat, mention I'll names. I'll say them, Patrick Wilson and Sean Connolly. They're okay, in I, their truck. Uh, yeah, I don't inebriated. talk names. <laughs> and and they, um, they're driving, and bam, they hit something. Mm-hmm. What the hell did we hit? I don't know. But they're so drunk, they're terrified of calling the police because they don't want, because they're drunk. And they, both of the people you've mentioned have problems with the law in the past. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to call the cops. You know, they're like, oh, let's just get out. And they take off. And the next morning they go, what the hell did we hit? Let's go down and look. I'll bet it's a deer. I'm sure we just hit a deer. And they go back down the road. And when they get down the road, they see the highway patrols there, the road, uh, got the, Tape, the road shut down, and they learn that Stephen Smith was struck and killed there. They're like, oh my God, we hit Stephen. Oh my God. And let's just keep this to ourselves. Let's not say anything. But in both of these scenarios, you vehicles are involved. It's yes. a vehicle-based. Yes, yes. Okay. And I mean, I've shared all this with SLED. Mm-hmm. I give them, I've given them specific names. I've told them these are the people. But SLED is just recently, as recently as, I want to say, late March 2023, they've told Sandy Smith's new lawyers, well, we don't believe it was a vehicular strike. And in fact, in fact, told them, you don't have to dig Stephen right, Smith's right. You body You don't have to up. exhume the body. We accept right. that it was not a vehicular strike. But well, saying, we, accept, we accept that he's dead. I'm not, I don't know that, and maybe you know better, oh, that I, they... they, ex, they they exempted the possibility of a vehicle strike. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't. Yeah. They may know more than After me. looking at the pictures, it, it, it's hard to exempt it. Yeah. So. But those pictures are never going to be no. released because they're so graphic. Yeah. So like the, no. So no. how do you how do you walk that line of, of showing people without showing them? Right. Like you're, you're asking them to well, take, you know, it's take interesting. their word for it. Obviously, I, I knew nothing about Stephen. I've never met the man. Don't know him. I've, uh, I think the world of his mother. I feel horrible for what she has gone through, not knowing. Uh, I think that she has been played by a number of people for a variety of reasons, all for self-serving agendas. And I don't know that she'll ever get the answers she wants. I sat down with her on more than one occasion, once... Well, I, 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 never mind that, I, I, you know. So, but I sat down with her on more than one occasion, and I explained to her, "This is what I believed happened. Mm-hmm. This is who I believe killed your son. This is the way it happened, mm-hmm. in my opinion." And I explained it to her, mm-hmm. and I also said, "Barring something unusual occurring, I don't know that anybody will ever be prosecuted for this." Oh wow. Because there's no physical. I did. Yeah. And she said, I'm okay with that. Really? I'm okay with, as long as I just know 
as long as I know, I'm okay, I understand. I said, I wish someone could be prosecuted. Someone should be prosecuted for this. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's physically possible based on where we are today and what we know now. In and the, the future, we might learn. Is time? Yes, primarily. It's been, at the time, it was five years after Stephen was mm -hmm. dead. Now, I went and interviewed a lot of the people that I've given names to SLED. Mm -hmm. When I was looking for people, as an example, when I was looking for people in Theory A, mm -hmm. one of the first things I want to do is I want to talk to Buster Murtaugh. Mm -hmm. Because all these theories, you know, oh, well, Stephen was gay and Buster's gay and they're having an affair. and All rumors. That's like internet fact. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> yes, it's all rumors, right? All rumors. So when you're looking at a case that's so old, um, you look, you dig up all the information you can about what was done at the time, what investigation was done at the time, and then you try to take it beyond that. Oftentimes the answers are there, they're just overlooked or mm -hmm. leads were never followed up on or whatever. So in reading and listening to all these audio recordings that SLED did, they, they do almost all their interviews of people on the phone. They, don't, they do next to no face-to-face -face interviews. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in that. You can't do an interview over the phone. Mm -hmm. I can't read your, ver your, your nonverbal signs You can't over set the phone. a baseline and notice no. if I change from it. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, only 7% of communication is done verbally. Mm -hmm. So 93% is done non-verbally. Right, the deviations. And, and like the that. only way to determine what's, what a baseline is mm -hmm. and what's a deviation from the baseline is you have to be in front of people. So I'm big in, that's, that, I'm big in that. I don't believe in the phone stuff. Interrogation 101. So I go out looking for all these idiots. And now it's five years later. So you figure back then they were like freshmen in college. You know, some had just graduated high school, some were out of high school a year or so. But it's right around that age. They're either 19, 20, 18, somewhere in that window. Hell, Paul was like 15 or 16 at the time. But the most part, they're all in that age. Well, it's five years later. So if they were in college, they've graduated. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have a job by then, They've got jobs, at least they should, now, right? So try to find any of these people now, very difficult. But I find almost all of them. But no one's ever home. You go and knock on a door and, you know. I live here in Charleston. Everybody's two hours away. So I drive there, I spend hours driving from place at point A to B, knocking, knocking, knock. I try that several days in a row, different times, see if I can catch anybody. I can't ever seem to catch anybody. So I, I revert back to, all right, I'm gonna stick a business card in the door. Now my business card has got the DEA badge on it. Mm -hmm. And it says, Stephen Peterson, senior special agent, department of retired. But no one ever reads the retired <laughs> thing. The fine print. They don't see the fine print. They see my name and they see the badge, DEA. So everybody calls me back, mm -hmm. thinking this is a drug investigation of some kind. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I mention Stephen Smith, some people freak and panic and will not talk to me and hang up the phone on me. Some people agree to meet with me and then change their mind and never meet. Hmm. Some people agree to meet with me and then text me and say, I'm not participating. Hmm. So, I mean, so the people that I really want to talk to, I can't talk to. I called, I called Murtaugh Law Firm. Back then it was PMPED or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to speak to Buster. I wanted to interview Buster. Well, this was right after his brother and his mother are murdered. Right. Talk about bad timing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I call and I asked, I would like to set up an interview. I understand. I assume you're representing him since you're family. Or if you're not, you can tell me who might be and I can go through their lawyers. Or what. And they say, no, Buster is not giving interviews. We're not talking to anybody. Hmm. But I just assumed it had to do with the murders of Paul and Maggie. So I didn't really push it because I can understand. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't talk to him. Mm -hmm. it makes sense if, in theory, everybody is pointing a finger at Buster. In fact, he feels so compelled, he has to make a statement recently that I had nothing to do with it, unequivocally uninvolved. But, and this is the first statement you're ever making? And it's nearly eight years later? I mean, mm -hmm. come on. So, but the other people, some people would talk to me, and a, a, a lot of people were terrified to talk to me. 
absolutely terrified. I, I, I can't talk to you. I can't talk. I'm like, what are you afraid of? I, I'm not afraid of anything. Oh, come on. Hmm. I mean, you can tell when talking to people. They didn't want to talk. Some did speak to me. But all they could do was say, well, I heard this from Will. Mm -hmm. I don't have any first-hand knowledge. I got it all from Will. So I go to Will. Will, tell me about this. I'm not talking to you. Hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm hitting all these dead ends. Very frustrating. I'm relating all this information back to SLED. I'm telling SLED everybody I've spoken to. Mm -hmm. I'm telling SLED what, whoever I have spoken to exactly what they're telling me. Well, why don't they haul these individuals before a grand jury? They well, <laughs> grand jury well, in panel. We'll get to that. <laughs> so initially, initially, SLED says, you know, uh, we are, I tell them that, you know, I've interviewed all these people. I've got all this information. We talk about the iPad being broken and Daryl and Daryl. We talk about all this stuff. And SLED says, we think there's a connection between Stephen's death and perhaps some of the people that Stephen was seeing based on rendezvous arranged online. Mm -hmm. You know, indicating that there's some type of relationship with other people. And I said, well, I don't have his iPad. I still, I, I've never <laughs> seen his phone. I don't have access to any of his phone records. You guys do. Mm -hmm. But now you figure it's five years after the fact. The phone companies don't keep those records that long. They might have toll information, which shows what number you dial, the billing information. Mm -hmm. But it's not like they can do in Alex's case, we're going to show you the, the towers that pinged so we can tell you where people were at, at, they, at mm -hmm. that exact time. Either that technology didn't exist back then, or they didn't keep any of the records that you could pull that back up again and recreate it. So Sled so says, we're going to pursue all these things, these relationship leads. Mm -hmm. And I said, he said, we, we found out that there he's, he's had, Stephen had several alias names that he was using online in a variety. He's an escort. Yes. He's a yes. homosexual yes. male escort. Yes. We're going to, and, and so I was like, okay, all right. And I said, uh, um, I said, well, I came across a couple of um, aliases as well. One alias they had, a second alias I gave them, they, they had never heard of. So they're like, okay, well, that's a new one. I said, well, they're going to run with it. Mm -hmm. So um, in the meantime, I'm now, but, but then SLED says, also, just so you know, we have proof that Buster and Paul were not even in the county on the day Stephen died. Oh, wow. And I was like, what kind of proof? What do you mean proof? Well, can't say. So this is the 80-20. So they have told you that during the course of their investigation, they've excluded Buster, Buster and, Paul. and Paul. This is what they told me back then, two years ago, 18 months two ago. Two years ago? Yeah, back in 2021. Yes, they told me this. And I was like, okay, so, all right, well, if what you're that telling me is true. That would seem to be pertinent information. Well, yes, it was, because, because of that, I stopped pursuing theory A. Mm -hmm. Because they just told me theory A doesn't work, because mm -hmm. your main players aren't there. Mm -hmm. So I pursued more theory B. Mm -hmm. And I went to the home of one of Theory B players, and I interviewed him. Now, I put a card in his thing, and he called me. And I said, I want to talk to you. Well, what do you want to talk about? I don't talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. I want to talk. Oh, uh, I, no, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk, blah, 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 blah. I said, well, listen, it just involves something that happened years ago, many years ago. Well, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. He says, no, I don't want to talk to you. Uh, you can call my lawyer. Sure, great. Give me your lawyer's name. And he doesn't. He doesn't have a lawyer. He doesn't. So he never gives me his, any lawyer's name. So then one day I just show up at his house. Not gonna, I told you I didn't want to talk to you. Yeah, but I thought maybe you decided you changed your mind. I just didn't get that call. <laughs> no, I'm not a cop anymore. I don't have to <laughs> do things by the book as much as I did back in the day. So yes, I ignored that. And by now, Sandy and Andy are parting ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sandy's not taking the advice that Andy is giving. They're having disagreements. That's between them. I don't get involved in that, but they, they end up parting ways. So I talked to one of the guys there, and he is adamant. I mean, he is aggressively 
trying to repel my questions. Hmm. He doesn't want to talk about it. He's not. And I'm thinking, listen, dude, this happened five years ago. Mm -hmm. If you're not involved in anything, why are you so upset about stuff? Mm -hmm. If you had nothing to do with it, who cares? Mm -hmm. Just tell me that. You know, let's talk about this. No, and he's screaming, I'm going to let my dog out on you. He's got this big dog that's, he's got in his little trailer barking. <laughs> I was like, well, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. But, <laughs> and so we go back and forth and back and forth. And he's, I'm going to call the sheriff and get you arrested. You're trespassing on my property. Get off, get off, get off. And I said, okay, all right, I'm leaving. I said, but I've seen pictures of your truck that were taken the day after Stephen's accident. And I've seen the damage. Now that's a total lie. I'm about to say that sounds like a bluff. No, it totally was. <laughs> totally. Was. He, I haven't seen those pictures. He goes off. Mm -hmm. He goes absolutely off. I told the police that was a deer I hit that day, and I told. And I was like, "You told what police? Ooh. Who did you tell?" I don't remember. Highway Patrol, Hampton County. Let's narrow it down to that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to you. Get out! And he starts. He starts. I'm afraid he's going to become violent at this point. So I do leave. I take some pictures of his car, but it's not the same car he had back then. Right. Right. So. And this is obviously Sean Conway. Yeah. Well, this is one of the people that were mentioned in your book. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, of course, I call we'll Sled as I'm driving away. And I'm like, son of a bitch. I said, this SOB's done it. This guy's done it. Really? This is the driver. This is the guy that killed Stephen. I said, I'll, I'll bet money on it. And so I was like, Just really? the response, yeah. the reaction. Yes, right? absolutely. People, people who have nothing to hide, hide nothing. Mm -hmm. If I were to go back five years and pick somebody from your town, you're, uh, you're in Columbia, I assume. Mm -hmm. If I were to go back five years and pull a name out of a paper in Columbia, somebody was killed and said, Will, I want to talk to you about this guy who was killed in your town five years ago. You would go, I don't know anything about that guy. Right. Well, but I think you might. So let's sit down and talk. Maybe, because I'll bet you if we really talk, you'll find out you have more in common with this guy. You may work next to him. You didn't even know. Things in common you didn't even know. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you had nothing to do with it, you go, oh, okay, well, maybe I can help in some way. You wouldn't become violent. You wouldn't be, get out of here. People I'm would thinking nothing... in my head right now about the, the image of sicking my dog on you, which... We've got a dying 14-year-old lab, and then we've got a little dorky. Well, so I don't think either one of those are yeah. going to scare you. Man. No, I have a chihuahua <laughs> and a 16-year-old English uh, or Australian uh, border collie who's deaf. So neither one of them would... Let, let me ask you an important question, though. We were just speaking of what you were told by SLED about Buster Murdoch and Paul Murdoch not right. being in the county at right. the time this happened. Right. Connolly, or the individual. Yeah. Did, when you gave that information to SLED, right. did you ask them about his whereabouts or the whereabouts of the other individual? No. Or have they told you anything about their whereabouts? After I told SLED about the people in the car, the two drunk idiots, SLED wanted to know how I got their names, how I came across them. Huh? And I told them, everything's in the reports. They're in the mate report, absolutely. They're in the reports. You just got to read through this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got their names, and I tracked them down, and I, I can't find this other guy. I'm looking for the second guy. I haven't been able to find him. Mm -hmm. He's jumping from couch to couch to place to place. His stepfather hasn't seen him in a long time. They're not communicating. You know, so it's like, goes, huh? Mm -hmm. Then, and they call me back maybe in the day or two after this, and they just say, hey, just so you know, We've expended all our leads on the escort right. aspect of this investigation. And we've come up with nothing. Mm. We've exhausted all leads. It leads nowhere. We don't believe any of that is a part of this. I was like, okay. I didn't think it was part of it anyways, but okay. I didn't know. There were a lot of names in his black book. There are a lot I'm of sure names there were. on that iPad. I'm sure there were. I haven't seen any of them. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the black book. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the iPad. I haven't seen all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that says we've exhausted. So we're going to focus on the guys you're looking at. Now, when is this? September, October, November, 2021. So this is within a few months of them reopening. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or opening. Yes. Formally opening. Yes. So I said, well, good for you. 
Well, the next thing I know, they pick up one of the guys, not the driver, pick up the other guy and they interview him. They're convinced he's concealing information. They, they want to polygraph him. He's agreed to a polygraph and then he changes his mind and won't, doesn't show up for the polygraph. Mm -hmm. So then, and it's funny because going back, again, I told you I was going to jump it's around a little bit because stuff happens. It's a complicated case. When I first sat down with Stephen's mom, she didn't tell me practically anything about this Mark Bickard guy. Mm -hmm. She didn't really mention him at all. And she just said he was some guy who showed up at the funeral claiming to be his boyfriend. She goes, that's bullshit. She had, he had nothing. They didn't see each other. Well, I was like, well, didn't he pay for Stephen's phone? Mm -hmm. You know, well, that's, he was just taking advantage, you know, blah, blah, blah. God bless. Sandy doesn't want, she, who wants to acknowledge that their son might have this other darker side mm -hmm. you know might be involved in things that most people would frown upon who mm -hmm. who wants I'm a, I'm a dad I don't want my think about my daughters that way mm -hmm. you know so she, that may be selective I'm only getting what she's telling me mm -hmm. you know and she's only telling me what she wants me to follow so I don't know anything about Bickard except that I've now I've heard all the now I'm getting cop I've got copies of all the audio now I've got copies I believe complete copies of the mate reports I've got all that now, and I'm reading through it sometime for the first time, and I can't remember where I got it all. It's, uh, the Highway Patrol may have finally responded to a FOIA request and gave us everything, but it took, it took a long time. Mm -hmm. We got a letter from SLED saying, we got nothing, we'll give you nothing. So, because back then they weren't involved, mm -hmm. right? So and the Bickhart interview was done by the Highway Patrol. Right. So you listened to that. Interview. Yeah, listen to the whole thing. Tell me. And I was like, well, one of two things. This guy's either a nut job, which is what he sounds like, or there's some reality to it. So I started looking into him, and of course he left South Carolina six months or so or whatever after Stephen died. But he was staying at various places. He's a self-professed. Uh, escort guy involved in the, you know, that kind of business. And uh, then he goes to Florida, gets arrested in Florida, gets charged with assaulting a correctional officer as well. He gets released, and the last I tracked him up was to Pennsylvania, staying in Pennsylvania. So in November, October, can't remember, my daughter, my youngest daughter, who is a chef, a pastry chef, a professional pastry. She went to culinary school and um, she, he, she gets a job. She had just spent six months in Wyoming at the large, she was the past, executive pastry chef for the largest guest ranch in the United States. A very exclusive place in Wyoming. Jimmy Kimmel goes there, Harrison Ford goes there. I mean, CEOs of airlines, they all, this is where they go. So she's the executive pastry chef. Yeah. So she got another job in Arizona, because they're a seasonal thing, because mm -hmm. it's kind of like, uh, what, what, what is that the movie with Jack Nicholson and there the winter comes and it the Shining, the Shining. yes, <laughs> this is place is kind of like the Shining, the big Jack Nicholson it, guy, yeah, in the winter they're gonna <laughs> freeze out, so they, it's a seasonal job. So she takes the job in Arizona, and her fourth day there, she's mauled by a dog, mm. so and rushed to the hospital. So I jump on a plane, I fly out there and take care of my daughter. I called SLED and I said, listen, something's come up. I'm going to leave town for a couple of days. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when I'll be back, but I just want to kind of keep you in the loop. Then I'm going to be, he's like, you're not going to Pennsylvania, are you? And I was like, what if I am? <laughs> you know, I'm just messing with him. And he goes, listen, we're bringing in people. We're going to Pennsylvania. We're going to go interview this guy. And we're bringing in special people. They said they were bringing in special people for the Stephen Smith, experts from around the state who are experts in interviewing and interrogating. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. This is for Mark Bickert. Well, for Bickert and to talk to the two idiots who are drunk. Okay. This is what they claim. They're going to bring in experts to do all this. And I said, listen, leading up to, uh, as we were going through the Stephen Smith case earlier on, I said, you know, what you need, I said, listen, in my world, things ran differently. We use investigative grand juries all the time in the federal system. Mm -hmm. I said, do you guys use them in the state system? Very rarely, like North Carolina. 
spent 20 years in North Carolina as a DE agent. I saw one grand jury investigation, one. And I was part of that. But so I said, I don't know how often you guys use grand jury investigation, but I'm telling you, this is the way to, on a cold case like this, this is the only way you're gonna succeed. Because in my world, if I interview you and you lie to me, you lie to my face, I can arrest you. Mm -hmm. It's a federal law, it's a violation of federal law. Title 18,001, it's against the law to lie to a federal agent. Mm -hmm. The state doesn't have the equivalent of that. So if the state comes and interviews you and you give them all bullshit stuff, they might could get you for filing a false police report. But unless you, unless you sign it, if you just give verbal, this is a story, there's nothing they can do. But if you go before a statewide grand jury. But if you go before a grand jury. Perjure yourself. And per exactly. That's a vastly different. Exactly. So I said, what you we need to do was you need to impanel a grand jury. He goes, listen, we've got a grand jury going. Mm -hmm. You didn't hear this from me. We've got a grand jury going. It's on the Murtaugh thing. I said, what you said, your powers to be have used the Murtaugh as an umbrella for all these things. Mm -hmm. I said, you need to subpoena A, B. I, I gave the list. People part of theory A, just for the sake of it, mm -hmm. and people part of theory B. You need to subpoena these guys. Because you know they're gonna, it's incredibly intimidating when you're called out of your county to another place to go into a courtroom to testify before grand, federal grand juries are incredibly intimidating. I can only imagine state grand juries are somewhat intimidating to people who don't know any better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You get them up there, they might just confess. I said, more importantly, the guys that weren't directly responsible, the guys who were riding under theory A, the guys riding in the car, but not driving and not sticking the object out the window, mm -hmm. the other people in that car, they were like, I don't want to go down for this. I, they think they've gotten away with this. It's been five years and no one's asked them a question. And then out of nowhere, comes this old fat bald DEA guy asking <laughs> questions. What the hell is this all about? This has opened up a can of worms that they thought was sealed. Well, and to be clear, we're talking about theory A, theory B. Right. Theory B has no shortage of Murdoch family connections. Correct. You've got right. the reference from Sandy Smith about getting the call yep. from, from Randolph Murdoch. You've got the references in the mate report by the Highway Patrol about lawsuits that uh, uh, Randy Murdoch brought. You've got the reference in the mate report about Randy Murdoch telling Patrick Wilson's stepfather to well, come forward. But no, that's wrong. That's not right. That's not correct. So they the agents... stepfather never said Randy Murdoch told me to call. But that's in the report. Yeah, I know. Interesting. He claims no. I said a lawyer told me to call. He told me the lawyer's name. Who was it? I don't mention names. <laughs> he told me the lawyer's name, but he but he's adamant it was not was it Randy. Mark Tinsley? No. Interesting. No. Okay. But but it was not Randy Murtaugh. He goes, I don't know how Randy Murtaugh's name got, because it wasn't him. Okay. And I was like, okay. But there's still two civil cases brought by Murdoch family lawyers. Then you've got Connolly, uh, or rather Wilson, facing these attempted murder charges. Right. Which are coming out of the 14th Circuit, which is obviously controlled. By the Murtaugh. By the Murdoch. So you've... So just, and I'm, again, the only reason I bring this up is we're talking theory A, theory B. They both got... They've all, yes, has some murder right. Connections. But, if, but if you look at anything involved in the legal aspects, if you look anything involved in the legal system in Hampton County, it's going to have Murtaugh's all over it. Because mm -hmm. if you're being prosecuted, Murtaugh's part of the prosecution team, whether it's only a part-time pretend job or not, Murtaugh's mm -hmm. got his fingers in there. Mm -hmm. And if it's a civil side, if it's worth any money, the Murtaugh's are going to be involved in that. So there's just almost no way to be involved in anything legally, you know, wise in the legal system, in having, that somehow the Murtaugh's don't have their fingers in the pie. Fair enough, but then you look at the outcomes. Right. You Suddenly those, cases are dismissed. That attempted Suddenly murder go charge away. got dropped. You're like, wait a minute. You know, I don't want to sound like some kind of nut job conspirator, but... Wait well, no, but you're you're not. The, the attempted murder charge involving Wilson was dropped right. by the 14th Circuit, and then yep. those two civil suits against Connolly were dismissed by Murdoch-friendly judges. Went away. Everything goes away. So now, do you think it was leverage? 
I don't, I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm. What, I don't know what the benefit would be to Murtaugh to stick up for the two guys that killed Stephen. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Other than keep your mouth shut, but why would he care? Mm-hmm. If they got convicted, how does that affect his family? You know, I don't, I don't, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I haven't seen all the information. But you did I haven't give, talked to all the players. You did give Sandy Smith your best assessment. Yes. And yes. is that still your best assessment? Yes. And tell, just for the, what did you tell her? When I told her. There? I told her theory A, theory B, but mm-hmm. I named names. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to name names here, but mm-hmm. I named names with Sandy. This, this, this. But Sled said no, because these guys were not part. They were gone. They're not there. And I, and, and I said, I believe it's these two guys. I gave her the names. I went into detail why I thought that way. And she was like, okay, all right. So the most important question, where is this investigation going today? Yeah, great question. No, nobody's talking to me about it. I don't know. They're, I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. The all, in my opinion, for whatever it's worth, in my opinion, the only way you're going to get these people to do the right thing is somebody's got to cooperate. So you, there are a number of people on the periphery who if they weren't involved directly, they were involved later on. Neither keeping it quiet or removing something, hiding something. Hell, the trooper tells me when I interview him, he was throwing a baseball bat and they threw the baseball bat in the cornfield right here. Somewhere in that cornfield the baseball bat is. And I was like, okay, well it's five years later. You think someone would have found a baseball bat. You know what I mean? So I went to the clerk's office. I dug through the property records. I found out who owned the cornfield. I went to the cornfield owner. I talked to them and the farmer who does all the tilling and harvesting. Because the trooper's like, and they harvested that corn in July. And everybody knows you don't harvest corn in July. Okay, well, I, I'm sorry. So you've chased down literally every rabbit hole. In this to, my, to my knowledge, that people will speak to me at. Mm-hmm. I went to a number of auto body places in Hampton, in, in the city of Hampton. Mm-hmm. And some of them were very, they don't want to talk. Because, God bless, the media has been ha- t- hounding everybody. You're right. There's somebody here from 60 Minutes, 20, 20, all these shows. You know what I mean? Trying to get the scoop. It doesn't matter if the scoop's right. They just, they want to be first. Doesn't matter if it's the truth, it's just whoever's first wins, regardless if it's true or not. So they're out there, but eventually I, I sit there long enough and talk to them, and, and people, you, you develop a little rapport. People, every person I spoke to spoke to me. Mm-hmm. Initially they didn't want to, but eventually they felt more comfortable, and they all said yes. Because my, my thing was if the truck was damaged, either by the Murtaugs or by the, the two idiots, if either vehicle was damaged, it would have to be repaired. Who would do the repairs? Well, one guy said, I do all the repairs on Murtaugh stuff. And gave me, showed me copy, wouldn't give me anything, showed me copies of records. I fixed this car, this car, this car, this car. Never, in this time window that you're looking, never did anything associated that could be associated with Stephen's death. But everyone I spoke to said, but if you go talk to this guy, Will, Will had this auto body shop down the street uh, and he is crooked as the day is long. And if you gave him an extra hundred bucks, he'd fix it and never tell anybody. Hmm. And, keep, and so I was like, really? Yes, the problem is Will, he died like two years ago. Hmm. So Will's dead. So you, he, he, if I were to bet, he's the one who fixed the car, but you're never going to prove it because Will's dead and the auto body shop's closed. And so I was like, damn. We've got destroyed evidence, missing evidence, dead potential witnesses, nothing really nailing down either of these theories. Right. How in the world is anybody going to bring charges in this case? You do, in my opinion, you do exactly what I, I begged Sled to do 18 months ago. You, you, you pick up everybody associated with this thing. You don't pick them up, but you go serve them with grand jury subpoenas. Mm-hmm. And you say, you go testify before grand jury. And some of them who are, who are guilty are going to go, I refuse to answer on the grounds of my incriminate. I plead the fifth. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to just have to get a DA, a prosecutor, to say, we'll give, we're going to roll the dice, take a chance. We're going to give you immunity. 
Mm -hmm. If you tell us what you know. You tell us everything. You tell us the truth. Now, you lie to us, that immunity agreement's off the table. But you're honest with us. We can prove it and corroborate it. You tell us the truth. You've got immunity for Stephen's death. So, I believe somebody would come forward because, God bless, it's been, it's been almost eight years now. Their lives have gone on. They don't want to lose or sacrifice whatever it is they've accumulated, they've achieved mm -hmm. from now since then. So there's all this attention now, all this light, all these new investigatory resources that SLED's talking about. But at the end of the day, it's still an eight-year-old cold case. Right. Of course it is. Does any of that light, any of that attention, any of those new resources increase the likelihood that we get an answer? Perhaps. They might have access to phone records. They can go back and pull toll information. Who, on, and looking like within 24, 48 hours of Stephen's death, who was calling who? Hmm. It's not going to tell you what they said. But at least it'll, it'll show a connection of people. And you might get a couple more people to interview based on that. And perhaps they could find out, for example, Mark Bickert talks about hearing the mud flat, uh, mud tires. Mud tires on which, the of truck. course, the driver of Theory B had mud tires back on the car he was driving back then. Has SLED, to your knowledge, confirmed any of Bickert's story about the mud tires? No the idea. Call logs. Couldn't tell you. He also claimed that Stephen was harassed at a, a gas station between Walterboro and yep. Islington. No idea. No idea. No idea. No idea. That would be a big break, potentially, if Absolutely. his story is accurate. Absolutely. Did you believe, and obviously you weren't the one interviewing him, did you believe Bickert when you heard? No. Well, no? yes and no. I mean, he rambles See, on so much. Oddly specific lies. Though. Yes. If he's lying. Yes. He's... I, I do believe him that he, he, he received a call. He spoke to Stephen. I mean, the phone records show that. Right? They show calls. So From Stephen to Bickard. Yes. And, and vice versa. At the time of the yes. incident. Yes. Yes. Because so the you've phone came. Yes. No. Take it back. I've not physically seen him. Mm -hmm. I was told about them. Mm -hmm. I guess I've seen him. In my mind's eye, I've seen but them. But SLEDs confirmed But SLEDs confirmed them. Those records are. Yes. Okay. So the records exist. Mm -hmm. And he's not hiding it. He's like, yeah. The call kept dropping. It kept trying to call him back. He called me back. We couldn't get. I've been out to the murder scene. I've been in that area of the county. I'm sure you have. You don't get service in some areas. You know what I mean? It's very spotty, depending on who your carrier is. So, you know, you listen to Big Heart talk, and, I mean, he rambles on incoherently about crap that's not related to anything. But the stuff that is related, it's too detailed to be bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I, in, in some areas, I do believe him. I do, and I don't believe he had anything to do with Stephen's death. Well, let's talk about Nick Ginn for a minute. The yeah, I know who he is. He's the current uh, uh, council member down there. <laughs> and that's sad. <laughs> well, he was cool. with I think Hampton County Police he was Department. Hampton Police Department got fired. Correct, right. and he is. Well, tell, okay. So this is a, this is a guy who claims to have gotten a call from. It was one of the, the guy's stepfathers. Correct. And again, and I don't want to put you on the spot right, on name and names right. here, but... So the stepfather calls him and says, listen, this is what my stepson told me. He and another guy driving in a car, ba-boom, hit something. Same story I just told you. Mm -hmm. he, he was so upset. My stepson was so upset about this event. So that ass... He was crying when he was telling me the story. When he finished, he went out on the back deck and vomited. I mean, these are details you don't make up, mm -hmm. right? And he stands by all that still. And um, he said, so uh, he tells me a story. So I called, I called the police. I spoke to Nick Ginn. I don't know if there's a relationship there or just somebody he trusted, somebody knew. So Nick Ginn, according to a report I read, went out and photographed the truck. Got these photographs, turned them over to the highway patrol. I've never seen these photographs. I don't know if they've ever if they were really taken. I, I located Nick Ginn. He's the only interview I did over the phone because I couldn't find him. And when I did find him, I didn't expect him to answer the phone. So we talked because I had him on the phone. But he tells me, I don't remember any of that. 
I don't remember taking any pictures. I don't remember. And I was like, how do you not remember? I mean, this was a big deal. A 19 year old kid is dead. I mean, does that happen frequently in Hampton that you would forget about it? You confuse it with another one? I don't know how this works. And he was very specific in his interview with the Highway Patrol. Yeah, I know. But he was very, he was totally denied it all to me. Hmm. Now, I asked Sled, I, I told Sled about the, in my interview with Ginn. I told him about what the Highway Patrol report said. And I said, according to this, he gave it to a trooper. And I don't remember the trooper's name, but Sled knew it because that trooper became a Sled agent. And I said, well, where are those photographs now? And the, guy, and the Sled guy I was talking to was just like, well, yeah, it would be nice to have them, wouldn't it? Indicating that they got lost. They, they're gone. This case could have been proven, couldn't have. If, let's go back. This is like the John Bonet Ramsey case of the East Coast. They drop you on Sandy Run Road the morning of July 8, 2015. They put you there. Right. You're in charge. Is, well, how, how, how quickly do you solve this case? Oh, well, that's, that's not easy to say because you've got to, you've got to start delving into... Well, you've got to go out and interview a bunch of people because you've got to figure out who the associates are because there's all these rumors out there, right? Five years later, the only way I can find the truth is I have to dispel, disprove the rumors. Mm -hmm. And then whatever you're left with, whether how unlikely it may be, that's the truth. Two, let me ask you two questions about the jurisdiction here. Yeah. Obviously, we established it was in the road, so it became a highway patrol investigation. Right. Sled's crime scene was there. Right. Hampton County Sheriff was but, there. But it's so interesting because Sled, I mean, mate, from the very beginning, keeps saying, this is a murder. This is not a car wreck. Well, then why the hell are you guys investigating it? I, that's something I could never figure out. Why, why do you have case it? From the beginning? Sled says, I mean, mate says, well, we couldn't give it to anybody. County said they didn't want it back. Sled said they didn't want it back. So we were forced to investigate a murder. That's ridiculous. Sled says, nobody ever asked us officially to investigate it. We went there initially thinking it was a shooting, and when we were determined it wasn't, it was a car accident, based on the pathologist's report, that we turned it over to mate. No one ever came back to us and asked us to take it. Who should have had this case from the beginning? Well, I, no. in my opinion, Hampton County should have had it. That's why you pay these guys. That's why you have a police department. But... If they don't have the expertise, if they don't have the technology to look at phone records and that kind of, if they don't know how to do it, then it go, should go to SLED. If SLED is like at the SBI, I spent 20 years in Charlotte, work with the SBI all the time. The SBI only gets involved in investigations at the request of law enforcement in the jurisdiction where the crime occurred. The only exception to that are narcotic investigations. Sled can, I mean Sled, SBI can initiate them on their own. All other invest, criminal investigations are, are done at the request of the agency that has original jurisdiction. I assume Sled operates the same way. Mm. I've trained enough Sled agents in narcotic investigations that I know they can initiate their own drug cases. But my, my belief is they can't go into a county and just decide on their own we're going to run this, this homicide. Someone has to say, we want your assistance. There has to be an invitation. It has to be an official request. It can be a verbal request. Well, I need your help on this. Mm -hmm. But Sled says that never happened. We were never asked, so we never took it. So we had the highway patrol who, God bless, they're probably wonderful at recreating accident scenes, working a murder investigation where if you listen to all the phone calls that they made, all the interviews, there are so many lost leads that were never followed up on. There were questions that were never asked. There were people that were never interviewed. Mm -hmm. That should have been. And I don't fault the Highway Patrol. Hell, they just, this is not their area. And they said as much walking the scene. We yeah. don't see any tire marks right. or vehicular debris or mirror debris right. or shards of glass yeah. or any of that. We don't see any of it. So why did they get the case? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, because nobody else wanted it. I don't know. Hell, I don't know. Let me ask you this. Sled has indicated within the last 
few months. And again, we're here in early part of 2023. So that has indicated making significant progress in the investigation. Great. What do you think they're referring to? Is it is significant progress saying, hey, we've gone back to these two guys that were initially yeah. made? You think that's what they're I think about? that's their significant, because they didn't have any of that when Paul and Maggie were dead, mm-hmm. were killed. Mm-hmm. The information was there, but no one ever read it. Highway Patrol, I mean, SLED never read any of the Highway Patrol reports. It wasn't until they got that information and he suddenly opened the file and read it and they said, well, damn, (laughs) there's information here. Yeah. So your belief is that the significant progress that SLED has made in the murder investigation of Stephen Smith is just literally opening the mate report and seeing those names. Yes. Now, they may have taken it further. They may have gone out and interviewed since... Now, I haven't been involved in this thing for about a year. Literally, I've, I, I've not been involved in the investigation into Stephen for about a year, maybe a little less. And because I couldn't go any further. I can't subpoena phone records. I can't get that information. There's only so much as a guy that I can do. I don't have the same authority the same subpoena power. I don't have that, that I can get this information, but they do. And I've had a couple of the people that I tried to interview who refused, said, I'll talk to SLED, but I'm not talking to you. I was like, okay, well, that's probably what it'll come down to. SLED will come see you one day. We've talked about the destroyed evidence, the missing evidence, the rabbit holes that seem to never end, the uncooperative witnesses. We've talked about all these things that have hindered the pursuit of truth, the right. pursuit of justice in this case. But let's talk about one other component of that, the, the factionalism of this case, the sort of, it's almost like teams rooting for a, a winner in a game. I mean, what, what's everybody your has on? A, It's like I said earlier, well, everybody has an agenda here. Everybody has an agenda. I, I, I can tell you, when I was involved in the investigation initially, I was getting calls daily from the media outlets, reporters asking questions, asking to speak, asking for interviews. Kind of, I did not speak to any of them. Didn't talk to anybody. All right. When then then there was only so far I could go. Then of course all the the uh, so I I basically sat down with Sandy and said. If I come up with any new information, if when Netflix came out, it generated some leads. And Netflix forwarded those leads on to me. And I pursued them. And it, they, they amounted to nothing. My mom, most of them were just crackpots who watched the show and had a theory of what had happened. Kind of like all these blogs you read about the Alec Murdoch trial. Well, I believe this happened. I believe okay, yeah, and, and then aliens came down. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, just just ridiculous. So I told Sandy, if I get information, I will follow up on leads. If I get information, I will be I will share it with you as I if I find it credible and if I'm able to follow up on anything, I will share it. She said, Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Now, she's she's on her third law representation, third legal representation. I don't know that the second attorney did anything to, to assist her in finding the truth. I, I'm not sure who established that relationship. I don't know how she found the guy. That's not my business. I don't care. But I don't think anything was ever taken further. Now she's on the third. He's put together a team, you know, had the body exhumed. Hey, maybe they'll find something I didn't see. Hey, maybe. God bless. I hope they do. I don't know. If you've got SLED working with you and people are open and honest and not trying to keep everything. At some point, I was even told by SLED that the Stephen Smith case is going to take a back, a back seat to the Paul and Maggie murders. We've got to solve that. We've got to convict the people involved with that. That's got to go first. When that's over, we'll get back to Stephen. And I couldn't understand that. I was like, well, why can't we do both? Why can't we walk and chew gum? Has SLED only got five guys? You know, can you only five guys work on Paul and Maggie and nobody else can work on Steven? Send me a rookie. Send me a guy right out of the academy. 
I'll ride with him. Hell, I'll teach him as we go. Well, yeah, they don't want to hear that. This is all ego. This is all about ego stuff. Mm. So Sled was made to look somewhat questionable in their abilities during the Murtaugh case. But that's the defense's job. No matter how great a case you might have had, the defense's job is to point out all the crap you could have, should have, would have done. Mm. That's their job. If you muddy up the water enough, nobody can see the clear picture. So, you know, because SLED was made to look stupid doesn't mean they're stupid. They're not stupid. They're very effective. They're very good. They're very professional. Things, did things fall through cracks? They always do. That's what happened in Stephen's case in the beginning. The body went from the street to the coroner, to the pathologist, to the coroner, to the funeral home. I mean, every time the body was managed by a different entity, evidence is, is, is lost. Mm -hmm. They took a rape kit test. Where's that? That got misplaced. That's never been tested. We don't know anything. Not that that would make a difference, mm -hmm. but the point is, hell, we can't keep track of what we got. <laughs> you know what I mean? And in 2015, a gay kid in South Carolina is killed on the side of the road. Did anybody care except for this family? Nobody cared. Nobody cares. He's just some kid. He's nobody. If it was Buster or Paul, oh, big deal. Prominent family. This is Stephen uh, Sandy Smith's son. She's nobody. Eh, eh, it's just like any other kid is dead. There's, a, I'm sure, thousands of people in this state over the years who have died in the last five years. Unsolved. Nobody cared. Then everybody cared. Yeah. And the only reason everybody cared is now the spotlight is on. Now the spotlight is on. And the, and, the, and the feeding frenzy has begun. And the cash registers are ringing. They seem to be. Ratings. And they seem, everybody's interested. Everybody wants to get their 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I'll be accused. You gave that interview for your 15 minutes of fame. Hell, I didn't ask you to come interview me. No. I have not asked for a single interview I've given. People have called and said, Can you, are you available? I mean, I've got every text. Yeah. I, I, I save everything. Yeah. So, I mean, I can show. This is, this is, the, this is the sequence of events. Mm -hmm. A year from now, they'll solve Stephen or they won't. Nobody will ask me a thing. Nobody will care. And I'm okay with that. I'm a retired guy. I just want to be able to tell Sandy. And I believe I've told her. This is what happened. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you earlier when you mentioned that, sitting down with her and giving her that, this is what I think. Did you tell her your level of confidence? Your, yes. What was it? I, I, I'm, I'm, the best I can tell you is about 90%. Mm -hmm. I have some doubt. Do I have doubt beyond a reasonable, you know, is it beyond a reasonable doubt? Yeah. Is it a case you could take to court? No. Not with what I have. But you were there on that property on that day with... Oh, you're not going to change my gut. And there's other people that I've interviewed who had similar reactions that while I know that they weren't necessarily involved directly, they were involved indirectly or they were a passenger in the vehicle, and they also know. Hmm. Theory A. Mm. Theory B. Yep. Steve, this is fascinating, man. I appreciate you. Being I wish I could give this. you more answers. No, on. I mean, what I you've given us is a, a perspective on this case that I don't think anybody else has. And also, the other thing I think that's pretty impressive about your perspective is that's probably the first one I've heard yet that just wants to find out what the answer is. You're not pulling from one team or the other team. God bless. I have a job, yeah. but I want to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't need this. So I don't care who did it. I don't care if it was Colonel Mustard in the kitchen with a <laughs> candlestick. You know what I mean? I, I don't mean to sound flippant or disrespectful, but I don't have a dog in this fight. It's a crime. Yeah. It's just, now it's, it's about it, it became a point where after, after Sandy and the Savage Law Firm parted ways, I spoke to Sandy and I said, do you want me to continue working on this? Because I was working on this indirectly for you. 
You know what I mean? Uh, while you didn't hire me, your attorney did. Therefore, I work for you. You're the client. I'm working for you. I'm not working for, and, and Andy was wonderful about that. You do what you need to do. I said, now if you tell me you don't want me involved, you just tell me and I'll go away. I won't, I won't do anything further. And she sat there, we sat down at, a, at a, um, a Starbucks in Walterboro and had this conversation. And I said, you tell me. When was this? November, December. I can't recall exactly. Mm -hmm. But it was, was, it was within a month of, of Sandy and Andy Savage parting ways. Mm -hmm. I let a couple weeks go by. And I remember speaking to her like right in the middle of this because it became a big thing and then it was on the media, there were blogs written about it and there were name calling back and forth. Well, not back and forth. I don't think, I don't think Andy Savage ever responded to any of the allegations that other people were throwing out there. Mm -hmm. And I think he took the high road on all of that. But, I, and I spoke to Sandy a couple times. I said, listen, Sandy, people disagree. I said, you're not going to agree with everything I tell you. I, I can't help, I can't change that. It is what it is. You know, don't shoot the messenger for the message. I would like nothing more than to tell you it was Buster Murtaugh. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not where I'm going with this. And she seemed to be okay with it, which I just found fascinating because that was the that was an issue that led to the breakup there. But so, so now you're okay with it? But people that she's associating with aren't okay with it. <laughs> and they insist it has to be. And if you don't agree with their perspective, then you're to be diminished in some way so that we can focus on whatever their agenda is. <laughs> nah, whatever. Just solved the case, right? It is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> I wish it. Yeah, but does the fact we may never get an answer? Oh, we'll have an answer. Long. The problem is we really? may never get. What's the final answer? If I tell you A and B killed your son, mm -hmm. I'm convinced. Will A and B killed your son? Mm -hmm. I'll never be able to prove it. I'll never be able to take him to trial. They'll never be arrested or charged for it. That's a tough pill to swallow. Of course it is. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. So does that mean the case is solved because one guy said it's A and B? In your heart, aren't you always wondering, well, maybe it was something else. Maybe, yeah. it, maybe it was theory A. Maybe I don't have all the information. Maybe, maybe somebody was concealing stuff from him so he couldn't pursue, that, wouldn't pursue that, which led him down this road. Maybe that was the intention, to deflect attention away from theory A, to focus on theory B. I, uh, mm -hmm. Right? So when, when do you say we know what we know? It is what it is. I don't know, if it was my child, probably never. What's the percentage chance that the person with the answer, or the people with the answer, let's assume there's more than one, What's the percentage chance in this case that they take it to the grave? And never if they could, if nobody else will come forward, I think it's a good percentage. The trick is the people who are responsible, the person who's directly responsible for Stephen's death may net, I assume will never admit it. But the people around, the people who were there, the people who know, the people who are participated, even after the fact, Number one, I don't know if they can live with it. Hell, they've lived with it for the last eight years and hadn't convinced anybody to, to come out of it, right? They're that, doing good, good so far, right? Right. But at the same time, you, you kind of put some squeeze on everybody and your weakest link will break. Mm -hmm. The trick is you've got to have that pressure. Without pressure, you'll never break the weakest link. But even if the weakest link breaks, I guess here's my point, eight years later... How do you prove it? Yeah, you've got one person standing up. Well, I lied. I lied all these years. Right. Well, the first thing the defense attorney is going to say, you've just admitted you're a liar for the last eight right. years. Right, right. What evidence? But maybe have? they'll come forward and say, yeah, yeah, I participated. How did you participate? After it happened, I did A, B, C, and D. 
Um, oh. oh, so now we can go and check and corroborate A, B, C, and D. Now, when this happened, these kids were 19 years old, mm -hmm. roughly. What 19-year-old kid keeps a secret? Mm -hmm. Ain't that many. They told somebody. Mm -hmm. So now you go and you start interviewing. You might get a whole new pe set of people to interview. Now, they may not have any direct knowledge, but they'll say, yeah, back in 2015, he told me that this happened. He told me. It kind of corroborates his story. Mm -hmm. If you were told that same story eight years ago, why didn't you come forward? Well, I don't want to get him in trouble. I mean, he was afraid. He was scared. Blah, blah, blah. You, yeah, you could. You could come up with a set of facts and circumstances that would allow for a successful prosecution if you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, the case against Alec Murdoch was a circumstantial case. And then everybody said it wouldn't work. Yeah. And I had my doubts as well. I, th those people restored my faith in juries. Because the Casey Anthony jury destroyed my faith well, in Well, barely. Juries. They were one, one egg juror away from, from, from being not hung. restoring your faith. <laughs> right. But Steve, what a story. What a perspective you bring to it. Thank you for taking the time to sit with us. Uh, I assume if we do get some sort of Big development in this case, you'd be willing to sit down again? Sure, but I can tell you pretty confidently, I will be not I will not be the cause of any big <laughs> Fair enough. Thing. I would I would love to be able to help. Nobody's asked for my help. Well, we're glad you helped our audience get us get a sense of where this thing has been, where it may be going, and um, certainly some perspective here that we've never heard before and invaluable to this case. And certainly um, I want to thank you for taking the time. Man. Oh, you're very welcome. You're welcome. Appreciate it, brother. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.